Shota Ijima was just an ordinary boy, living an ordinary life. That is, until he found some random storybook on the riverbank three years ago. Little did he know at the time that this book would awaken something sinister deep inside of him. Why, you ask? Well, that's because merely opening the book automatically disrobes him. And to add to that, its contents are so out of this world that he's chosen to worship it and call it Erohan Sama. Inside is a full-blown harem filled to the brim with willing, luscious ladies. And to give proper justice to this work of art, our boy celebrates his 1,000th straight day of being in a committed relationship with his right hand. That must be tiring, you think, but not for him. Dinging the dong is just like breathing to him by now, second nature. They say everything comes and goes. Well, he definitely does. So whether it's the 2,000th or 10 millionth day, he wholeheartedly swears to continue his daily devotion to Erohan Sama via his devious ways. But the main issue is that he must preserve the book's cleanliness. With his projectiles flying further than expected, and the distance growing due to the recoil from the power of his heavy artillery, he realizes that no human reflex could possibly spare the book from eternal damage. What he does is he closes it so that only the cover gets messed up. Shockingly, this results in the book glowing ever so brightly. And with that, he's gotten isekai At least it ain't truck coon this time. He now finds himself in a jail cell alongside other children. When he approaches these foreigner-looking kids, they look back at him with disdain. After all, his unmentionables are in full display. But it's not the time to care about that now. He tries to talk to them in an unknown language, only for the kids to give him puzzled looks. Is it a language barrier? But no, they trash talk him in Japanese. This makes things easier. So after Shoda awkwardly introduces himself, he asks why these boys are imprisoned. And yes, the irony behind his name and current situation isn't lost on me. One of them says his name is Carl. Apparently, they're all here in this slave house in the capital city as merchandise to be sold. He then asks if Shoda's a wizard. After all, the boy appeared from a bright light out of nowhere. This has Shoda joyously remembering how he activated his powers, only to realize that he's in a different world. Instead of being stoked, Shoda is devastated. Erohan Sama, where are you? He shuffles around the room, desperately looking for his most prized possession to no avail. Oh no, without it, Shota Jr. can't go to school anymore. If you're wondering how all this looks to Carl, the word is cringe. All of a sudden, an old, noble-looking man appears from outside the cell. Judging by his appearance and escorts, this guy might be pretty important. Without giving him any form of clothing, they pull Shota to a room where he's faced with the slave merchant Budageha. The noble observes his unusual features, black eyes, hair, and a different skin tone. The oldie comes to the conclusion that he isn't from this country. Puzzled, Shota asks what country they're even in. Budegaha seems to have taken extreme offense to the fact that the boy's oblivious to the existence of the Dragon Empire, the ones that united the entirety of the elven continent. Nope, still doesn't ring a bell. Shota judges the empire for its weeby name and fires back another question. Do the people here know about Japan? That confused expression tells him what he needs to know. Well, the slave merchant shrugs the question off. With the boy's rare characteristics, he can demand a higher sum of money. When the boy wonders where he's being brought, the man explains that they're headed to the continent's biggest funhouse for women and hell for men, the Valhalla Ding Dong Mansion. The guards put him in a jail-like carriage alongside Carl, and they begin their journey to the destination. When asked what the mansion's like, Carl explains that it's a funhouse that belongs to the kingdom. It houses male products chosen by their royal highness. And when they've been chosen, they're announced as a royal concubine. Shota inquires why the king would need a dude, to which Carl mentions that the top figure, Annalise, is a young woman. Not just her, actually. All the important people in high up positions are female, from the guards, ministers, captains, soldiers, wizards, and clerics. Not just in the Dragon Empire, but this entire continent sees men as nothing but tools for satisfaction and reproduction. Oh, how the turns have tabled. In any case, that's why boys like them get used as entertainment toys. As Shota looks outside, he confirms if their customers are all women. Carl tries to calm him down, but say yes to his answer at the same time. Surprisingly for him, Shota begins laughing mischievously in the corner. To many of the boys there, this may be their most harrowing nightmare, but to Shota, this is his dream. His once quiet snickers crescendo into maniacal laughter. Jackpot! He puts himself on full display as the passersby observe his dangling assets. And to add to that, everyone on the street was a character from the book he was reading. Screw Japan. This is Valhalla. They finally arrive at the mansion, with Shota fully determined to become someone in this world. Welcoming them are several ladies in maid outfits, with a very energetic one standing at the center. She's Charlotte, the head maid here. 
Her thunderous voice reminds them that once they pass through these gates, there is no escape. The vice head, Johanna, confirms if only five boys are coming today. They do their count and eventually point their affections towards our rare species, Shota, and his lack of clothing. Charlotte asks why he's crying. Little does she know that those are tears of joy. Though she's initially stunned by his features, she eventually realizes that he's really cute. Her flustered expression gives off more than she'd like, but our boy's too conscious of this pretty lady and her presence's effects on his extremities to notice. Anyway, she pulls him to the bath area. He needs to have a bath before meeting the director, after all. Unbeknownst to each other, they both have sinister intentions. Charlotte makes sure to slyly torment him there in the most maddening ways, almost pushing Shota to the edge. She asks him to call her Char, and our boy's brain melts into total simp mode. Oh, he'll do more than that. If she wants his boy berries, he'll serve them on a silver platter. But before things can escalate further, though, they're distracted by screams of help from the other side of the bath. It's Johanna, forcing Carl to eat some of her product. Shota can't believe what he's seeing. It's truly a sight to behold. Charlotte reminds her vice head to take it easy on the newbies, to which the latter refuses, saying that they'd better get used to it quickly. Carl is nearly passed out from suffocation, but it seems that Shota's also dying, from jealousy. That should be him. And to this I say, that should have been me. With that, our heroic boy calls for the vice head's attention and shyly tries to save his newfound friend. When Johanna catches wind of his intentions, she commands him to take Carl's place, but shockingly for them, he excitedly obliges. He even prepares his best position for the job. It's my first time, so please do it slowly. All the maids are shocked, and Johanna enters another plane of existence. Both her and Shota are glad to be alive at this very moment. Our boy thanks his flute lessons back in the day for providing his mouth with the necessary dexterity for this day. He's been practicing with his imagination all along. Charlotte thinks that this world unfairly turns men into playthings, and as such, she must protect Shota from this tragedy. But when he's able to make the legendary Johanna scream like a first-timer, she can't help but wonder who he really is. It's another day, but this one's quite special. It's time for Shota to meet the mansion's director. Two women jest that they hope the new boy won't go crazy from this place's hardcore rules, but maybe they'll get more than what they bargained for. In another room, Char excitedly dresses Shota up in a bathrobe. While it's definitely comfortable, it's kinda odd to be meeting such an important person with his dongle dangling around. He soon enters and finds a blessed woman welcoming him, alongside a more childlike figure. The former introduces herself as Ursula, the director of this Valhalla mansion. Oh boy, she's ticking all his boxes here. He can't wait to lay his hands on her. God, he could feel the shield hero about to rise again. While the other boys nervously quiver in their seats, Shoda stands out from the rest. He redirects his attention towards the girl beside the director. She's just grabbing snacks from a tub when she points her gaze at him. She praises Ursula for the outfit choice of bathrobes so she can peek at their blind items. Happy as can be, she looks towards Shota, who effortlessly smiles and waves back. Budegaha screams at him to show some respect, but before he can say who she is, she cuts him off and reprimands him for speaking out of line. The old man begs for her forgiveness. Still trying to make light of the situation, Shota raises his hands to ask a question. Firstly, what's her name? She initially makes a mistake, but reveals herself to be Hilda. How old? 500. Er, she means, the Roman numerals X, I, I. When asked if her horn is the real deal, she lets him touch and stroke it. She's genuinely pleased to find someone who isn't terrified of her. For Dragonkin, someone touching their horns is more embarrassing than any other part of the body, and he's just doing it without a care in the world. But then, Hilda asks herself why she's even letting him touch her horn. Before she can do some introspection, Ursula cuts them both off. Hilda refuses to accept a loss and grabs Shoda's Tralala. But wait, is he really... You know, his name? Because why the hell does it feel like an elephant trunk? As for Shota, our boy's in cloud nine. This is the first time someone's, uh, shaken hands with him. But wait, the one who did that to him is Hilda, a lolicorn. Does that make him a lolicorn? He denies it at first, only to decide that maybe he is. And what about it? Meanwhile, Hilda can't believe what she's holding on to. It feels like a legendary sword from the folk tales. To confirm, she pulls his robe off and exposes him to the other maids. It was at this moment that everyone was introduced to the legend, the Dovahkiin, or Dragonborn. A boy born with the armaments of a mythical creature, even Ursula's smitten by his weapon. Shoda nervously tries to hide it, while Hilda laughs her brains out. She lets Ursula know that it's time to wrap up negotiations. Ursula announces that everyone, except Shoda, is worth 100 gold coins each. That's fair. Shoda begins panicking that maybe he wasn't sold, 
But for him, Ursula makes an offer of a hundred thousand gold coins, an unspeakable offer that rattles even Budegaha to the very core. A thousand times more? Moreover, the amount will be paid in full right away. Shota wonders how he could possibly have been a thousand times more expensive than the undoubtedly handsome Carl. Anyway, the transaction achieves completion with a happy slave trader walking away a rich man. Hilda announces to the boy that he'll be hers from today till the next three years. That's an indisputable decision. Oh, happy days. But at the end of those three years, he'll surely be a great product slash service. Serve all the women here well in that time frame, and she swears to grant him any wish that he wants. As Hilda and Ursula walk down the hall, they discuss the sight that's clearly imprinted into their minds. It was an absolutely lethal weapon on a planetary scale, the object of dreams, the Dragon Slayer, a magical item that can alter course of history. In this world, ordinary men wield swords the size of an index finger, but Shota's is easily twice that. To add to that, when fully ready for battle, his thing's just as solid as Mithril. Ursula comments that even the usually calm and collected Hilda lost her marbles at the sight of that. Anyway, the latter comments that he'll be working as an entertainer for three years. Women all over the world should flock in droves to experience his weapon. And, if all these women give birth to offspring, then it should alleviate their population issues. So his first order of business is to get ten women to give birth. Now in the confines of his room, Shota looks forward to pushing Hilda to the very brink. While he would have preferred the more mature Ursula, there is no such thing as a loss here. He remembers her words that even if they don't expect much for him, hopefully he does his best. His thoughts are interrupted by a knock on the door. It's Charlotte. She wants to talk. Our boy entertains his guest with a nice cup of tea, but we all know that she isn't here for the tea. She's here for his fourth letter of the alphabet. They both look at each other, and the tension between them is so thick you could cut it with a knife. Just to be sure, Shota checks that he's turned off the CCTV crystal sheltered at the corner of the room. While this is happening, visions of his nuclear missile can't seem to leave Charlotte's mind. She's in the mood now. What throws her off, though, is that Shota shows no signs of fear or hesitation. Does he not know what she intends to do to him? Oh, girl, trust us. He knows. Pushing that aside, she starts making up her excuse. As the headmaid, it's her job to make sure that all the boys are healthy. Thus, she must conduct regular taste tests of his byproducts for a whole month. Damn, a taste test. She gonna make a short about it too? Shoda, on the other hand, can't believe what he just heard. Surely it's a lie. He even trembles at the idea. He shakes nervously, but that's actually him being over the moon. He's just trying to hide how overjoyed he is, especially considering how differently they perceive the situation. She sees this as a boot camp. He sees this as paradise. And if previously he asked her for tips, now she's asking for his tip. Will she do a good job? He's kind of insecure since he isn't as good looking as the other boys, but he pulls out the secret weapon. Its size is enough to put stars in Charlotte's eyes. Arise. Those stars turn into hearts instantly. Without further ado, the maid gets to her business. Shoda's overwhelmed not only by her skill, but how different it feels from his usual routine. It's clear that while he's having the time of his life, she's enjoying this too. More than five minutes later, the job is complete and Shota's so happy that he gives her a hug. He wants to do more of this, and that's why she promises to check his anointments every morning. This elicits a delighted reaction from our resident degenerate. He even says he loves her, and she reciprocates it. Does that mean anything? We don't know. But hey, now he receives not one but two free services in one day. Before he knows it, he's already in the mansion's massive cafeteria for lunch. This elegant place can easily seat a thousand people, and the food isn't anything to scoff at either. However, instead of marveling at the generous facilities, our boy's head is still in the clouds. He's all hung up over the morning's events. It's only his first day, but he's looking forward to so much more. That lights the flame of resolve to work hard and move up the ladder. He then notices Carl on the other side of the room. The boy's clearly gotten the life drained out of him. Even when he greets his friend, Carl can only muster a pained response. It's only been a day at work, Carl, but we get you. He comments on how Shota's still so lively in man. He truly is built different. Shota misunderstands the comment as a physical remark, noting how he finds his Eastern features inferior to the other boy's more Western ones. Anyway, he enthusiastically mentions how he's looking forward to servicing all the ladies and working hard to satisfy his customers. Carl mentions that his optimism has made him the center of attention. Before he can continue, a commotion stirs up at the cafeteria's entrance. Barging in is a well-dressed youth that people refer to as Mikhail Sama. The guy has an arrogant grin on his face, giving off the aura of a spoiled noble. He walks up to Shota, who couldn't care less about what's going on here. 
Expectedly, Mikael blasts him for being overhyped, as his black hair is the only thing going for him. He's short, small-eyed, and definitely not worth the 100,000 gold. Whoa, buddy. Slow down there. Considering these are all pain points for Shoda, he gets annoyed, but he just keeps eating. One of the ladies raises her voice at him for being disrespectful. How dare he keep eating in the presence of Mikal? The arrogant boy demands his name, but Shoda reminds him that it's rude to ask for someone's name without giving yours first, ticking the guy off. And with that, Mikal formally introduces himself as the best product here in the Valhalla mansion. Shoda just says his name, then asks how much Mikal got sold for. He must be a prized commodity to walk around with that kind of arrogance, right? Well, 1,000 gold coins. But at the time, that was the highest price people were ever going to pay. Shoda notices that this guy is just insecure. That's why he tries to appeal to Mikael's softer side by explaining that someone's price doesn't determine their true worth. At the end of the day, the most important thing is to remain prideful in their jobs, satisfy their customers, and remain professional. Mikael angrily slams the table while screaming, how can they be proud of such a job? Shoda nonchalantly responds that he's just here to satisfy the customer, he isn't a hero or whatever. Mikael, appearing to be extremely passionate about this topic, reminds him that all women here are savage beasts. Any newbie would be crying in the corner by the end of the day. Shoda just looks at him with a blank expression. This leads Mikael to remember something and ask his assistant what day it is today. It's Saturday. Upon hearing this, he laughs in a comically loud manner and lets Shoda know that it'd be best not to get picked by the notorious newbie crusher. And with that, he walks away. In the lobby, a short-haired lady strategizes her approach. She knows she's just one of today's hungry customers, so she can more or less see what other people will be picking. Unlike their conventional choices, she knows she's a bit peculiar. Her dark secret is she loves tormenting the fresher boys, the newbies, until they're completely exhausted and have nothing left to give. She's able to release her pent-up stress by bullying these poor youths and letting them know how bad they are at their job, which has led to her nickname, the Newbie Crusher. Watch out, boys. Imperial Guard Mercedes is here for you. Shoda excitedly goes to the display cages, eager to begin his first day of work. The mansion is now open for business. He admires the women coming in. They're all beautiful, but Carl looks on in disgust as they're all sick in the head. He's been through really rough treatment at the hands of his handlers. Since they're one of the lowest on the totem pole at level human, they're extremely cheap, but aren't allowed to go all the way. Shoda sees multiple women that are his type, but they aren't picking him. Things are looking real bleak. That's until Mercedes asks him to show her his face. She's fascinated by his black hair and chooses him as a result. The sight of this cool female knight excites Shoda as he willingly walks down the hall with her. This causes Charlotte to run to the director's office, reporting that Shoda could be in trouble. After all, he was chosen by the infamous newbie crusher who's destroyed more than 20 of her boys. But they can't do anything about it except hope that Shoda will survive this ordeal. If only they could see the Cheshire Awe grin on his face. He gets strong S vibes from her, and he's looking forward to all the rough treatment she's going to bestow upon him. She's quite similar to the materials he has in his books. And god dang, she's got rumps and bumps for days. Life is so good, Shoda can't help but cry. He's finally about to have a rodeo with a dommy mommy. This is when Mercedes notices that Shoda's clinging on to her. Isn't he afraid since he's new? Plus, he's looking cheery, which leads her to believe that he hasn't been raised in a normal family. Man, the Ajima family's catching strays for Shoda's degeneracy. Oh well, it doesn't matter. She'll be using that method. They'll be playing a game, and it's a test that he must pass. Today, their role play will be older sister and little brother. Uh-oh. Both the director and Charlotte nervously watch the live feed. Mercedes is a strong-willed woman of focus and commitment, and she may be too much for poor little Shoda. She's like the John Wick of the underground entertainment industry. And with her signature brother-sister roleplay, many boys have been traumatized from its after effects. They begin to wonder if Shoda will just become a shell of himself afterwards. And now we return to the scene of the action. Shoda looks at her, nervously, thinking of what to do next. He references all the anime he's seen in the past, going over what he can and cannot do. He was an only child too, which makes this even more difficult. Fully resolved to carrying the role well, he suddenly cries and runs into her shoulders. Even she's taken aback by this sudden shift. He begs for her time and affection, laying his hands on her eighth wonders of the world in the process. Up next, some back massages. And those do feel extremely relaxing. It's even a little ticklish. Yes, yes, that's a sensitive spot right there. His hands are magical. Even Mercedes can't help but admit it. She's making all sorts of noises now and just melting into his arms. With a thumbs up, she's showing extreme gratification, but Shoda brings it further and asks her to get in a state of nature and lie down. 
time to get to work. Cue the satisfied mules of a freaky muscle mama. Two hours pass like nothing. Despite all that time, Shota's confident that he hasn't pulled out all the stops just yet. He apologizes for taking so long. With this, she stands determinedly, doesn't even bother dressing up, and runs. Her heart and soul can't take it anymore. This is what she's been looking for. When she gets to the receptionist's desk, she goes full on, shut up and take my money mode for an extension. How long? The whole day today. Time to continue. Shota carries on with his magic hands business, and Mercedes's dommy expression melts into a cute one, which he finds adorable. All this is great and all, and the woman's ascending in all sorts of ways, but the same can't be said for Shota, whose weasel's about to go pop. Unfortunately, they can't go all the way since it isn't part of the package, and Mercedes is spent already. So that's when he came up with a brilliant solution, a cat-led massage. Upon seeing his gargantuan gobsmacker, she can't help but compare it to the mighty, legendary creatures she's faced on the battlefield. This sparks something in her that makes her more than willing to perform his request. The director and Charlotte aren't idiots. They know what's happening, but they can't help but watch these events unravel. Like a full-blown MMA fight, it doesn't last for one round. Not two, but three full-length battles. The director is impressed. Three in one day, that's crazy. What she doesn't know is that Charlotte's made it five today, a truly impressive feat. The head maid really admires his ability and is certain that lots of women will surely fall for him in the future. The day ends with some cuddling and one final rodeo after dinner. So much energy. Finally, it's time to depart. Mercedes reassuringly pats Shoda on the head and promises to be back every weekend. He even cries as she leaves. But hey, it'll just be till the next week. This magical book has turned Shoda's dreams into a reality, and it seems that his skill set and approach towards life are heavily rewarded in this alternate universe. He's impressing ladies left and right, but no need to worry, there's enough of his loving to go around. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.